Welcome to the show that puts you at the centre of the national conversation, talking about the issues that matter to you the most. Tonight, immigration. The tricky issue that has tormented government after government for decades that many believe lay behind Brexit. Tonight it has the Home Secretary under pressure again. Suella Braverman has already resigned once, admitting that she broke the rules that govern ministerial conduct. Now she's back, but chaos at an overcrowded asylum processing centre in Kent has some, even those on her own side, wondering whether she'll make it through Halloween. I'm Trevor Phillips, and this is The Great Debate. Tonight, the MPs knocking at Home Secretary Suella Braverman's door won't be asking for treats. They want answers. Why are there more than twice as many asylum seekers as there should be at Manston Immigration Processing Centre in Kent? Did she ignore legal advice that might have allowed more accommodation to relieve the pressure? And what's she going to do about what she herself today called our broken asylum system? And does she even have a plan to tackle the wider labour shortages that are crippling the economy? As ever, our viewers panel from around the country and indeed around the world will have their say and they will tell their stories. And joining us in the studio tonight are the Conservative MP for Dover, Natalie Elphick, Labour's Shadow Immigration Minister, Stephen Kinnock, the barrister, former asylum seeker and human rights campaigner, Adironke Apata, and the Deputy Director of the Migration Observatory, Rob McNeil. The big question tonight, how do we solve Britain's immigration dilemma? The cost of our asylum system has topped £2 billion a year. The Home Secretary is under growing pressure over the treatment of refugees and migrants when they arrive in the UK. 4,000 people in a facility that was designed to hold 1,500. That is wholly unacceptable. Let's stop pretending that they are all refugees in distress. The whole country knows that that is not true. They should send them to Rwanda. And them that can't go to Rwanda, send them back to France. There is absolutely nothing racist about wanting Britain to have secure borders that work. We saw dozens of migrants carrying a boat to the sea in full sight of French police officers who did nothing to stop them. It's not sustainable to keep doing this. Right, let's begin, as we always do, with our viewers panel joining us on the screen and talk to John Soderberg. Uh, John, you're in Lancaster, I think. That's right, Trevor. Good evening. Good evening, John. Your thoughts? Well, um, if we look at uh, the current issue, it's probably one of two uh, problems. Uh, the first part of the problem is getting to our waters uh, in this instance or on our shores and the second problem is what we do with them. Uh, I'm really focusing on the first part of it uh, and that uh, I'm concerned that France in particular is turning a blind eye to the immigrants that are coming into this country in this manner, i.e. the small boats, uh, and this begs the question as to whether the UK is allowing France to ignore tens of thousands of illegal immigrants departing from their shores each year. And indeed, uh, up to the 10th month, which is finishing today, uh, it's a record 40,000 uh, immigrants. Uh, we had 28,000 last year, to give it some context. So my question to the panel is, what is France's role in all of this? Thank you very much for that, John. We'll come back to that in a second. Let's speak to Victoria Scold. Victoria, I think you're in Sunbury on Thames. And you also have a question for our panel. Yes, so whilst I support workers coming over to do skilled jobs and they should be in this country to build, help build out infrastructure, what I 
don't believe in is the illegal immigrants and migrants coming over on the boats. How can we, the UK, financially support those from other countries when we can't look after our own? So my question is, how can we stop the small boats? Victoria, thank you very much. Well, there's a direct question from Victoria Scold. How do we stop the small boats? Natalie Elphick, this is your shore, isn't it? It certainly is, and it's very much my shore that the boats are arriving into. Uh, they come into the Dover facility. And uh, I think in those questions, it's absolutely hit the nail on the head that these are boats that are leaving from France. And there's absolutely no need for anyone to get in one of these small boats. It's illegal immigration. It's run by criminal gangs, and it's incredibly dangerous. Just last year... 27 lives were lost in a single day. More than 100 people are thought lost, uh, not accounted for. It's really important that we actually take action on the French side, they stop the boats getting in the water, and that we actually also save lives in the process. So you, you would specifically, how would you stop those boats? How would they actually be held up? Well, I'd like to see joint patrols with France on the beaches. Because, Military patrols? Well, I think joint patrols with our border officers and their border officers, indeed with other European partners as well. I think it's absolutely vital that, that we actually give that support. They need to have more bodies on the ground. But also, as we've seen in some of that footage, I'm sorry to say, you know, sometimes they have been standing uh, by even shockingly, when women and children have been put on those boats and the French haven't uh, intervened in that. So that's got to change. We've got to tackle it, first and foremost, in France on their shores. Uh, Stephen Kinnock, um, I think we're spending something north of £100 million a year uh, on helping France patrol that bit of its shore that looks towards the White Cliffs of Dover. Are we getting our value for money? My understanding is that about 50% of those who attempt to cross are being stopped. So that's clearly not good enough. Um, and there's massive room for improvement. The government needs to rebuild its relationship with the French government, which has not gone into a good place, I would say, generally speaking, since uh, Brexit. And, of course, uh, the previous Prime Minister's comments about not being sure whether President Macron is a friend or a foe were deeply unhelpful. But to get to the heart of this issue, we've got to sort out the processing of asylum claims in the UK because that system has completely collapsed. And the result of that is that those people who want to come across on small boats know that once they got, they've got to the UK, they'll be here for at least two, three or four or five years because the system has collapsed. So if we actually got to the heart of the matter, speeding up the processing, which means resourcing the Home Office properly with decision makers and case workers, you would then, if you were going to pay $10,000 to a people, people smuggler, you'd think twice if you knew that within two or three months your claim could well be rejected and you could well be sent back. But if you know you're going to be in the UK for two, three or four years, even in limbo, it's a gamble worth taking. Well, you brought that up, Stephen. Um, isn't the real reason that they know that they will not uh, be sent off somewhere else is because in January 2021, we... Uh, after leaving the EU, uh, came out of what was called the Dublin Convention, uh, which meant that we could return uh, people who landed here very quickly, very swiftly, to uh, countries on the continent where they might have been fingerprinted and identified. But when we came out, actually, we couldn't do that anymore. And, in fact, if you look at the numbers, it's quite striking. 2020, fewer than 9,000 coming across on the boat. Mm. 2021... 29,000. Yep. Yep. Isn't uh, that the reason? You are absolutely right. And when you, you combine that, the fact that the former Prime Minister but one, Boris Johnson, completely botched the Brexit negotiations and failed to negotiate a successor to the Dublin Convention, combine that with the collapse of processing of asylum claims in the Home Office, you have a perfect storm, which okay. has led to these massive backlogs and has acted as a magnet for more and more people wanting to come over. I don't care. I mean... We've had a lot of conversation about Home Office incompetence and so on and so forth. But do you think that actually, at the root of this, there's bigger forces here, one of which we've just been discussing? Uh, my thinking is this. It is not something that anybody wants to do, wants to go on the small boats, that is wanting to have covenant with death. It's been mentioned here that children and women die on those boats. 
and that's not what should happen. What should happen is for governments to provide safe passage. Because when there is safe passage, we can cut off the people smugglers, and people would not die unnecessarily. That is more of compassion. People can come into the UK through what we can call the legal route, which is quite safe for them, and then they can claim asylum. There would not be this backlog and the possibility of people dying. Kerry Ann Jones, um, you asked the question uh, about this. You just heard what Adironki has said, that actually nobody really wants to get on a boat, that actually there must be better ways of doing this. Uh, you are there in Dover. Um, you're seeing uh, what's, coming, what's, what's coming into the town. What do you, how do you respond to what's been said? Where a lot of them come in. Ann, we, ha uh, Ann, we had a bit of trouble with your sound there. I wonder if you could just start again, because I, I know that you've had uh, a direct experience with meeting some of the migrants. Yes, I live, I live directly on one of the routes that is used when they come in in the dinghies off of the beaches. My house is literally round the corner from the beach and I had somebody in August actually caught half over my back gate who petrified me to the point of I now sleep with a sledgehammer. I'm a single parent to a six-year-old autistic little girl. That must be terrifying. Do you... Abs uh absolutely as anything. Do, do you understand, though, what Adaranka is saying here, that it um, would take something to make somebody take the risk of getting on these boats, crossing one of the busiest sea lanes in the world, with the knowledge that people have uh, been tipped out, people have drowned on that crossing? Oh, yes, they definitely do. I mean... Um... Where I live, you actually see the search and rescue helicopters. So I know firsthand that it does. And I totally agree with what she was saying. There does need to be a safe route. Women and children should not come this way whatsoever. Natalie Elphick, we've got a, if you like, a collision of two ghastly things here. The awful problem of the people who are risking their lives and somebody who's scared out of her wits. No, absolutely. And that situation of the boats landing uh, is on a number of the coastal villages and areas in my constituency of Dover and Deal. And it's been going on for a very long time. And people do get extremely frightened. And I completely understand their concerns. Boats shouldn't be uh, landing on the beaches. People shouldn't be having those experiences. So it's really vital that we get a grip of this issue. Turning to that question as to whether uh, people uh, are safe, people are safe in France. There is no reason to be getting in one of these small boats. It's absolutely vital that people claim asylum if they need help and assistance in France or one of the many other safe countries that they come to. If we uh, go down another route, I think we just put more uh, into the hands of the criminal gangs. And that's what we've seen, this problem getting worse and worse and worse. We really need to tackle it and tackle it on the French side to make sure that we work with, the, with France on the beaches and across the Channel. In that way, if migrants and people smugglers know they can't get across the country in a small boat, it will stop. Rob McNeil, why is it not possible to stop people leaving the beaches at Calais? Well, I think one of the first things that we should probably bear in mind is that there, there's a sort of presumption in a lot of these conversations that France isn't doing anything to try and address this problem. Well, I mean, other than obviously the patrols on the beach, but France has seen quite a lot more asylum applications than the UK. Um, it's granted asylum to more people than the UK. France, France is also almost certainly not the port of not the port of entry into Europe that most of these people have uh, have come. So they they will be potentially have come. They will potentially rather have come from Italy or from Greece. 
um, prior or to... Or from Albania. Or from Albania. Probably well, via Italy or, or via Italy and, and then France, presumably. Um, but that, pro that process means that if you don't... If you consistently basically say, well, it's not our problem, it's the, the country next to us next to us is problem, so France is problem, then you're constantly pushing things back to another place, and that doesn't necessarily help very much. I think it's also important to recognise that stopping people from coming over... I mean, I think everybody's agreed that people coming over on boats is extremely dangerous. It's not a desirable scenario. It is a scenario which has been, to some extent, created by a suite of actions that have been taken to try to prevent irregular migration before. So the securitisation of the port of Calais was undertaken specifically to try to prevent irregular migration in the first place. And the outcome of that was to basically push people towards, for, towards different approaches mm. to doing this. And those different approaches... I mean, the idea... Yeah. Idea, realistically was that by securitizing by secure by adding security to the port of Calais you would create a barrier which was too dangerous for people to come to consider yeah. so effectively the risk of death was the deterrent but unfortunately we've seen that that doesn't work so, and so recognizing that one has to take steps that are going to be that are going to be a little bit more about negotiation and diplomacy rather than sort of trying to put a hard line uh, somewhere let, 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 let's see what the um, <laughs> view of our our wall is on that question about... It's essentially about our relations with the French. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask um, the pa our viewers' panel this the question, whether you think, in reality, it is possible for this government to do a deal with the French that would achieve what some of our panellists have been in the studio have been talking about, to find a way through this. Can we do a deal with the French? Those who believe that Mr Sunak... Ms. Braverman, have what it takes to do that deal with the French. Hands up. The, those... those uh, we'll just pan along a little bit and see, cos I'm actually not seeing anybody who thinks that it is possible. And there are quite a lot of thumbs down <laughs> there. Thank you. Uh, Natalie... Before I come, I'm going to come back to some uh, to, to screen. Natalie Elphick, that's pretty um, conclusive, isn't it? Nobody seems to think that we can do a deal with the French. Well, we did see last year that, you know, an offer, a really sensible offer, was made to President Macron, um, which he turned down in the after these dreadful deaths that happened yep. about joint patrols. But more recently, there have been warmer conversations, and my understanding is that those have been going much more positively. I think it's absolutely vital that we, we take that action, we have that diplomacy, that we do everything we can to stop the crossings on the French side. All right, let's, let's widen it out a little bit from our relationship with France. And let's talk to Marzia in Oldham, who herself was an asylum seeker. Marzia, um, talk to us about your story. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Marzia Babakarheil, and I'm a former judge and women activist from Afghanistan. I was targeted by the Taliban. The twice tried to kill me. And uh, finally, I escaped from my country and came to the UK. I put asylum and in um, and 2016 I became a British citizen. When I arrived in the country, I cannot speak a word of English. So I joined the college to learn the language and learn the culture of this country. And uh, currently I'm working as a caseworker with uh, local MP Debbie Bryams uh, to support and help people who need. Uh, for me, is uh, the best way to welcome a uh, refugee, to give them chance to contribute and uh, support each other. I try, I tried okay. and I'm trying my best to build bridges and contribute in this country and give back to the UK because I count UK like my home. Okay. Mm -hmm. Marcia, thank you very much. Um, Stephen, uh, would you say that this is a, perhaps a more typical story than some of the ones that are concerning us today? Can I just say how inspiring it was to hear Marzia's story? That is um, about the spirit of the people who come here. What an amazing person, a, a, a female judge in Afghanistan. It takes real courage to be that in the first place. And I just wanted to pay tribute to Marzia for what you've achieved and how you've come here and learned English 
uh, and contributing so much to our society. And, and I'm, it really is heartwarming to hear that kind of story. I, I think that we have to remember that there are many, many people who are fleeing violence and persecution. And that's what the refugee system is about. We've signed up to that since the Second World War. Winston Churchill played a key role in that. So let's never forget that 75% of the people who claim asylum in our country are granted asylum because they are genuine refugees. What we need is a process to ensure that those who are not valid asylum seekers are separated out and sent back to their country of origin. But the system is so clogged up and broken that the, the problem with it is okay. that even brilliant no. people like Marzia get caught up in all of the well, bad um, we, we, vibes we are, around this whole question. We are going to go on to talk exactly about that, the issue of process. You're watching The Great Debate. Up next, Suala Braverman vowed to do whatever it takes to reduce the numbers arriving in small boats. But is the plan to send people to Rwanda a workable solution? Or do we need to find another way? I would love to be having a, a front page of The Telegraph yeah. with a, fly, a plane taking off to Rwanda. That's my dream. The Rwanda scheme is sort of eye-wateringly mad and callous. We don't think it's immoral to offer a home to people. Stop deportation! More than 1,000 people crossed the channel over the weekend. We know we have to do more because the numbers are still completely unacceptable. very close to the center of there's one they found this devastation to their apartment lots of people live here quite a few of the windows of the houses have been blown out by the blast and it feels that it's changing each day Explosion has just come down. I'm Stuart Ramsey, and I'm Sky's chief correspondent. You either live and recover, or you die.
Welcome back to The Great Debate, where we're asking, how do we solve Britain's immigration dilemma? To say there are huge challenges for the Home Office is putting it mildly. The number of migrants who've crossed the Channel so far this year in small boats has almost reached 40,000. The government's now spending £6.8 million a day housing asylum seekers in hotels. There's a surge in illegal migration from Albania and the plan to process people in Rwanda has been stalled in the courts with campaigners claiming it's immoral. So, what should be the way forward if there is one? Let's talk to Charles Coy. Um, Charles, you're in Clacton-on-Sea in Essex. Yes, hello, Trevor. Good evening, Charles. What's your view? Uh, good evening, Trevor. I mean, what I have to, what I want to say is that uh, Rishi Sunak spoke about integrity and accountability, but shortly after was appointed to a Breverman as Home Secretary, a few days after she was being stuck by um, Les Truss for breaching ministerial code. Suella Breverman, I think, must be forced to resign. She's a barrister and also a former Attorney General. Now, would it be right to say that she should deal with her own false appointment into office before she attempts addressing British migration issues and the government Rwanda scheme? OK, okay. Charles, uh, as ever, uh, not missing your word. That's, um... Let's see if we can find another point of view. Let, let's see if uh, Chris, Chrisilda Basu, who's an old, uh, old friend of the programme, uh, Chrisilda, <laughs> you're in Altenham. What's, what do you, what's yes. your thought about what Charles has just said? Pretty hostile well, to the government. Well, in my opinion, um, the, Ru the Rwanda, Rwanda scheme should work if it's given a chance. As a country, it has shown to be progressive. Other countries in the past has been through the type of war that Rwanda, Rwanda experienced in the 1990s and 94 to 94. And those countries are functioning on the global stage. I think that there are organisations who do not want to promote Africa in a good light. To... Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, is the right person to make the Rwanda scheme okay. work. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chris Hilda. Um, uh, putting that view forward is uh, courageous, if nothing else. Natalie Elphick, um, Rwanda's not got a lot of supporters on our wall. Well, I think what we've got to see is it was part of a package of measures brought forward to try and tackle this issue. And as we've seen, 40,000 people now have come into the country through the small boats routes. This has been increasing year on year. It's become increasingly difficult to deal with the process uh, backlog, as we've discussed. And so you know, the, the idea behind this is to make sure that people are looked after safely in line with our obligations, but also to make sure that they can be processed quickly so we can deal with some of those backlogs that we've got. But at right. the moment, it's stuck in the courts. It's, you know, people who don't like it have held it up in the courts and we don't know how long that's going to take. It could be months, it could be more than a year. OK, Adronke, that, you, you heard what somebody said there about, um, essentially, the reason that people don't fancy the Rwanda scheme very much is that they're dissing Africa. Well, I don't think so. It's not about projecting Africa in the wrong or right way. This is about human beings. But honestly, do you think people would um, react in the same way if, instead of Rwanda, we were talking about Canada, which quite likes having immigrants? I'm sure people will still react the same way, especially in a place where there's no oversight. Because right here in the UK, we have seen problems from the government especially in detention centres, where there is no oversight to see what's going on there for people that are being detained. How do you monitor people from here that would be taken to Rwanda offshoring? In fact, we're talking about stopping people smuggling. To me, the government is kind of doing the same thing. 
wanting to send people to Rwanda. Okay. Which I think it's not right because, in fact, when you look at people that are seeking asylum, that are LGBTIQ, that's another problem there. Okay. The government impact assessment says that LGBTIQ people are not safe in Rwanda. Then why does the government want to send people so to LGBTIQ so the problem is to Rwanda, Rwanda? You're saying really? Yeah. No. Okay. All right. Let's let's talk uh, again to Connor. Connor Sumrall, um, uh, in Ma Mansfield, aren't you, Connor? Um, hello again. Yeah. Um, you've got a question for our panel. Yeah, after seeing that Suella Braveman's continuing with the immoral Rwanda policy and are using insensitive language like the invasion on our southern border that's particularly insensitive with what's happening in Ukraine, I'm just wondering, is she up to the job of Home Secretary? Thank you so much, Connor, for that direct question. Is Suella Braverman up to the job of Home Secretary? I'm wondering what you're thinking, Stephen Kinnock. <laughs> no, she's not. Um, she should either resign or be sacked by Rishi Sunak. She has breached the ministerial code uh, on a number of occasions. We've also seen there are very well-resourced stories saying that uh, articles in newspapers and also from her own backbench MPs, Roger Gale, the MP for North Thanet in the chamber today, said uh, when Suella Braverman took over, that's when the problems in Manston started because she stopped transferring people from Manston to other hotels. That led to the crisis we have in Manston now, outbreaks of diphtheria, scabies. These are not the sort of things we should be seeing in 2022 in the United Kingdom, in what is supposed to be a civilised society. So because of her cruelty and because of her incompetence, uh, the uh, Home Secretary should resign. One okay. word, if okay. I may, on okay. Rwanda. Yep. Uh, it is uh, unworkable, it is unaffordable and it is unethical. It That's is not acting words. as a deterrent and it is costing millions uh, and it's not right to offload our problems onto a developing country thousands of miles away. OK, I'm going to come to Rob on, on the Rwanda question in a moment, but um, Natalie Elphick, um, do you want to respond on the specific question about Suella Braverman and her appropriateness? Well, over the uh, last week or so in Dover, we've seen these boat landings that we've spoken about um, and these terrifying instances for residents in my constituency. We've seen the dreadful uh, situation of overcrowding, uh, which is at the cause of the problems at Manston. And uh, we've also uh, seen the absolutely horrific firebombing in the Dover facility um, just on Sunday, which I do think we should also mention in this context. But what did Labour want to talk about today? What do Labour want to talk about all the time? They want to talk about who Suella Braverman sends emails to. I think that my constituents and I want to talk about how we're going to get this issue fixed and how we're going to make sure that we stop the small boats crossing crisis and we save lives. OK, I'd like to say that, but the question he asks is, is Suella Braverman up to the job? Well, I think she needs to be able to focus on the job that, that she's doing, and that's what I want to see. I want to see us really concentrating on sorting out the small boats crossings. It's such an important issue, and we need to make sure that the Home Secretary... I, is, I don't want to go on about on it, that. but it's, it's not a ringing endorsement there. Well, I think that we need to see action taken on the small boats crossings. Okay. And, uh, you know, as I've set out, there okay. are a number of ways in which we can do that. But the situation that's happened in my constituency over the last week, it's been incredibly serious and it okay. needs urgently to be addressed. All right, uh, let's go back to Rwanda, the, the Rwanda question that was raised earlier. And Rob McNeil, um, is, is this arrangement so unique? I mean, I think there are third country removals elsewhere, aren't there? They, there are some. I mean, Australia famously undertook those things. They don't do offshoring anymore. They stopped in 2014. I think the thing with the Rwanda policy that's worth understanding is that it's effectively a symbolic policy. It's about sending a message about what the UK is going to do rather than actually doing something substantial. The number of people that, are going to be, that would potentially be removed to Rwanda is extremely small compared to the number of people that are arriving on small boats. So the presumption is that it's going to act as a deterrent. Now, 
as we were discussing earlier on, I mean, the, the, the presumption that the sea would act, that the sea and that uh, the, the risk of death would act as a deterrent and stop people from crossing over with the securitisation at the port of Calais was not successful. There's no real evidence that the Rwanda, that the deterrent effect of the Rwanda policy will be necessarily effective. And what we do know is it's extremely expensive and something of a distraction from what may be the really sort of the really big problems that should be addressed, such as the clearing of the asylum backlog. Mm -hmm. And clearing the asylum backlog is in everybody's interest. It's extraordinarily expensive for the country to, to, to have to deal with huge, with more than 100,000 asylum seekers. That's a very important point. But what, what, what is the key to that? Because we now know that the average uh, time taken to turn round an application. I think it's today 480 days is what, well, so the best part of a year and, and a half. But why is it? What takes so long? Well, it's a very difficult question to answer. What we do know is that there was a service standard that was expected, that was abandoned in 2019. And that service standard was that 80% of asylum claims would be processed within six months. Because that was dropped in early 2019, or after that was dropped in early 2019, we saw a very, very substantial decline in processing time, or, or an increase in processing times. So that last year, I mean, in, so in 2018, 87% of 87% um, of asylum claims were processed within, or were initial process, initial claims were processed within six months. In 2021, that was it was down to six percent. Mm. So, the the key, the, the Home Office does need to focus on spending money where that okay. money is going to be best okay. and most effective. Okay, thank you very much. You're watching the Great Debate coming up after the break. Britain's employers are complaining they can't get the staff. Should it be easier to hire migrants? Workers have been in short supply, and many doubt British agriculture can grow if its foreign labour force shrinks. Shortage of labour cost us a quarter of a million pounds in May. The idea that you can overnight close down the borders and not allow in critical skills that we clearly aren't going to grow in Britain soon, that's just putting growth second, not first. Immigration has to reflect the needs of the economy. I recognise it's a big issue for businesses, but they've got to accept that the public have concerns about that too.
Welcome back to The Great Debate, where we're asking, how do we solve Britain's immigration dilemma? From telecoms, to farming, to construction, to the health and social care sectors, there are staff shortages. Record vacancies might seem like a good idea to some, means low employment, unemployment. But companies are struggling to fill the jobs, and that means they can't grow. So should we turn to migrants to plug the gaps? Let's talk to Cheryl in Bournemouth. Cheryl, you um, work in a nursery, I think. I do. I run a group of day nurseries, and we are desperately short of staff, which means that we're having to turn um, parents away uh, with their children. So we see immigration as a really good way to bring graduates into the country, uh, but there are massive hold-ups. We're not even on the short staff list um, with the Home Office. So I've got a question, um, you know, how can we use immigration to fill this gap? Or how else can we fill the labour shortage that we've got in early Thank you. years? Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, Louise Brown in Sunderland. Um, do you have the same problem? Um, I think that we do need more immigration, yes. Um, since Brexit, there's been huge gaps in services due to shortage of staff. So here in Sunderland, we used to have lots of Polish bus drivers, for example, and now a lot have returned home. Um, the buses simply don't run properly and are very unreliable, and I'm dreading getting on them tomorrow. It's not just buses, though. There's also shortages okay. everywhere, um, so agriculture and food industry. Um, okay. And British workers clearly don't always want to fill these roles. OK. Um, hold, so hold that thought, I've Louise. As, mm -hmm. Hold that thought, Louise, because I think that's a very important point. Rob McNeil, um, it's a big problem, isn't it? Well, it's certainly a challenge, but, I mean... A lot of this is about low-skilled migration. And when I say low-skilled, I mean, I don't want to be pejorative about this. We're just talking about jobs that don't require a lot of training to, to, before you qualify to do them. Um, but that's, those are the people that can't come into the country now, and that's effectively as a result of Brexit. Brexit, people voted specifically to try and reduce the number of low-skilled migrants in, coming into the UK. And that was very specifically the objective of the policy. It was the objective of Brexit. You know, the government has basically said they want to move to a high-skilled, high-wage economy. And so, yes, I mean, it creates serious problems. Um, but the question is, are those the problems that are those problems that people are willing to accept in return for lower migration, particularly lower skilled migration? OK. Uh, uh, Stephen Kinnock, uh, isn't part of the problem here British workers are, well... They don't want to do certain jobs, but uh, they also don't want too many migrants because uh, the unions think that they bring down wages. You need a balance. We're not going to back, go back to free movement of Labour. That's clear. That's clearly Labour's policy. We need a points-based immigration system, but we need one that's based on proper dialogue between trade unions and the government and employers so that you have a workforce plan on a sector-by-sector -sector basis and that plan says this is the amount of immigration we're going to need and this is how we're going to train up our local workers and pay them properly, thus making it more attractive to homegrown talent but without letting it, the, in, the sector collapse because you don't is, allow is enough a, immigration but, to come in. But is the net result of that that actually we will have more immigrants, more migrants doing work? I see it as a balancing out so that you will need in some sectors immigration to ensure that the sector can keep functioning and we're seeing real problems in hospitality in health and social care in agriculture but so bring the migrants in but make sure that you make the employers give you a proper workforce plan with proper recruitment proper way of putting wages up developing skills and productivity that's the deal that the government should be doing with trade unions and employers so that over a, over a time cycle maybe two three years you're reducing immigration and increasing homegrown talent and opportunities. What you can't, though, okay. do is just turn the tap off because that's really dangerous for the sector and for the economy. All right. I wish we could talk about it more, but we can't. We have to go to a break. You're watching The Great Debate. There are no civil bu silver bullets to this immigration dilemma, but has even talking about it become too scary? Should we, can we, start a more honest conversation about the future of immigration? They've come to seek work in Britain and are ready and willing to do any kind of job that will help the motherland along the road to prosperity. There is no doubt that on the doorstep in local communities, 
Immigration has suddenly become very high in the agenda. All these Eastern Europeans want to come in. Uh, Where are they flocking well, from? We're cutting immigration across the board. Which party is serious about stopping the invasion? We had the British women's team late last night and they finished qualification in second place. So they'll be heading into the team final tomorrow and uh, the boys team start about half past 11 this morning. So uh, yeah, fingers crossed they'll have a great day. The results have been coming through and obviously getting better and better over the past few years. We've had a, a magnificent summer with the Commonwealth Games, the European Championships, Joe Fraser becoming European champion. Um, so obviously I think their confidence going into this championships is really high. There's a number of factors. I mean, it's taken a long time since um, the results have come through. Um, we targeted the younger gymnasts. Obviously, when they uh, first came through the programme, you started to get results back in sort of 2002. And then obviously that starts to create a belief within the team. You start to have role models for younger gymnasts coming through. The athletes are lottery funded, which massively helps. They only focus solely on their gymnastics. They're not having to, to worry about a career outside of gymnastics. And then obviously they get the support behind that, whether that's the medical support, the coaching support, the facilities and being able to travel the world to do all of the tournaments to to get that exposure and that experience. A lot of the stars that you're going to see here in Liverpool are going to be the stars of that Olympics in two years' time. Um, for me, it's obviously really special to be here in Liverpool. This is where I did most of my training, literally five minutes down the road. Um, so to see that the British team here competing, all the young gymnasts in the audience. They've got a fan zone here, which has been incredible so many young gymnasts getting opportunities to to meet with the British team to have a go on some of the activities so it's really inspirational for that younger generation coming through Welcome back to The Great Debate, where we're asking, how do we solve Britain's immigration dilemma? Suella Braverman isn't the first Home Secretary to run into trouble over immigration. Uh, she probably won't be the last. Every government promises to grasp the nettle, but the issue never seems to be solved. Worse still, it's one of the topics that seems to make every politician uncomfortable. So can we ever have an open and honest national debate without finger-pointing and accusations of racism? Let's see if we can start that. Let's talk to Ray Price in, I gather, and Rainy Neath in South Wales. It is indeed, Trevor. It's uh, absolutely hammering down here. Um, good evening. Good evening, panel. I've um, got a question for question us. My question for you is, yes, uh, do we need more honesty from our politicians when it comes to immigration, as they seem to promise everything but deliver nothing? 
Adironke, not a politician. Thank you for the question. I think that is very, very important. The politicians should be very, very frank and honest with everybody. It is time to break down the system that is in operation right now because they're just not working. It's just too convoluted. It's got to be broken and people need to be honest about it and face reality and make sure that everybody has honest debate and contribution into how it works. For instance, I just go back to life before we went on break, just to add to what Stephen said. We are talking about people working. There are people in this country also who are seeking asylum that are not allowed to work and they have good skills, brilliant skills, that they can contribute into this country. Why are they not being allowed to work? Actually, that is a question that I think it would be good to put to our viewers' panel. Um, Adaronke has just asked the question, should asylum seekers be allowed to work? She says they have skills. Other people say that that would encourage people uh, to take this route. Let's see. Those who think that asylum seekers ought to be able to be allowed to work if they are in the country. Hands up. Those who think that they ought to be able to, allow, to work. And we're going to... Oh, that's very... That is very interesting. That is very interesting. Um, an overwhelming majority there, Natalie Elphick, think that if asylum seekers make it into the country, while they're waiting for their refugee status to be regularised or not, they should be allowed to work. What do you think? I think it's really important, if we're having that honest conversation, to look at why people are coming uh, into, the, into the country, particularly on the small boats routes. We know that the majority at the moment are coming from Albania, are economic migrants rather than um, asylum seekers, as most people would understand it. So it is about work and about those draws to work. So I think it's really important that, that we just bear that in mind. Uh, Stephen Kinnock, both um, Labour governments and Conservative governments in the past have held the line on this one and said asylum seekers can't work. Well, asylum seekers are allowed to work after 12 months. Our position has actually been, and we tried to amend the Nationality and Borders Bill on this, to reduce that to six months. We've, we believe that every single asylum claim should be processed within six months and every person should be given leave to remain if they have passed the and granted asylum and be able to work from six months. The government refused our amendment and insisted that it should be 12 months. So and that I think is that's a change a waste. in the Labour position. You think that actually at some point... They ought to be able to work even if they haven't got refugee status yet. Yes, no, well, we want all refugee processing to happen within six months. But even if it hasn't, from six months onward, they should be allowed to work. Um, the current ruling is they can work after 12 months, but only in the shortage occupation lists. Thank you very much indeed. That is all we have time for this evening. Uh, I think... I just want to uh, say thank you to all our panellists this evening. And I'm going to... Actually, before we go, before we go, I just want to check with our viewers' panel. Um, Stephen Kinnock says that, actually, we could have uh, the opportunity for asylum seekers to work before uh, they've got full status. Can I just quickly see who agrees with that position? Who thinks that would be a good thing to do? Yeah, and we've got a majority there. Thank you for giving me the extra time to, to be able to do that. Um, that is actually all we have time for this evening now. And it now just remains for me to say thank you to our panellists here in the studio. Robert McNeil, Adironke Apata, Stephen Kinnock and Natalie Elphick. Of course, uh, all of you who are watching at home are always at the heart of our conversation and many of you may want to join in the programme at some point. So the way you can do that is to email us. Send your emails to thegreatdebate at sky.uk and we are going to be here every week until the end of November. I want to say thank you to our viewers panel. OK. And for you at home, I want to thank you for joining us this evening. Keep talking.
And we'll see you again at the same time next week for The Great Debate. Thank you.